Good morning and welcome to Submarine Live. Uh, during this week, we have been exploring the science and life of submersible exploration. We've been connecting to the Necton First Ascent team on the ocean surfer and they're using su submersibles to explore the deep ocean around the Seychelles archipelago in the Indian Ocean. We've also been diving deeper into some STEM topics. We've been doing live investigations, looking at issues such as pressure and buoyancy. And today we'll be looking at why submersibles are shaped the way they are. All of this part of the AXA XL Oceans Education Program. And we're broadcasting at the moment from Sonodyne HQ, an engineering firm making it possible to communicate underwater. Very shortly, we'll be connecting to Robert Carmichael, the Chief Submersible Officer on the Ocean Sefer in the Indian Ocean. Um, but for now, we'll just take a chance to welcome some of the schools who are watching. So, wonderful to have schools from the UK and Portugal. We have uh, Door Primary, welcome. Uh, two classes from Door Primary School, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have E.B. Um, de Galiza uh, in Portugal. We have uh, Nishkam School in West London, Earlsdon, and um, it's great to have you all with us. And some special shout outs. Um, Seven Humility uh, from Nishkam School, West London, who are currently studying pressure. Hi, good morning. Um, good luck with your uh, KAT2 exams. Uh, best of luck. I hope they go really, really, really well. Um, we've also got uh, a year five class um, from Earlsdon Primary um, in Coventry in the UK, and a big welcome to you too. Now, what is fascinating about the Necton First Ascent mission is how it increases our understanding of the ocean. Now, for years now, for decades, scientists have been studying the ocean. They've been using scuba gear. That's uh, so sort of like the, the sort of air tank on your back and the diving you might have seen in various films or on the TV or in, or in the news. And that allows you to explore the ocean down to a depth of 30 meters. So that gives you a good idea about that sort of Nemo type tropical reef down to 30 meters, but we don't really know what lies beneath that. To access that deeper region of the ocean, we need to have different types of tools. Now the Necton First Ascent mission is using submersibles and I think we'll just get a, an idea of what those submersibles look like before we connect uh, to the uh, team who are on the vessel in the Indian Ocean. Now the footage that you'll see will show this amazing sort of round pressure hull the, which allows scientists a 360 degree view of the underwater world. These submersibles allow scientists to go down to a depth of 250 meters. So if you imagine that we've only really scratched the surface with scuba gear, that top 30 meters, now we're looking a bit further down to 250 meters. And at those depths, the light starts to disappear. And it's not sort of a thousand meters that no light penetrates, but it really does feel dark down there. Another tool that the scientists will be using, we looked at this in the live investigation yesterday, looking at being an ROV scientist. Now, ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, and it's basically a robotic submarine. And they can go down even further, so the ROV being used by the Necton team can go down to depths of 500 meters. So from our understanding, the scratching the surface for 30 meters, 250 meters in the submersibles, 
and then another 250 meters down to 500 meters below the surface using ROVs. That is absolutely fantastic. And I've just been hearing that there is a, we should be getting um, a signal through from the ocean Cephet and the research vessel shortly, but they are experiencing um, some issues this morning. Uh, so hopefully those will be resolved uh, very, very shortly. I'm just going to have a look at some of the comments and queries coming through uh, and see what we can do while we are waiting for them. Not always easy um, to connect from the middle of the Indian Ocean. And for me, what was truly exciting was the fact that we now have the technical capability of broadcasting live from the submersibles underwater. And, and those broadcasts went out to 79 um, television channels around the world last week and the week before. So that was a really, really exciting first um, to have that live TV of the underwater world. So shortly, I'm hoping to be able to raise uh, Robert Carmichael and we'll be able to put the questions to him. So just touching on a couple of questions from Earlsdon Primary School. Thank you so much uh, for sending those through. And the first question, I'm going to speak from my experience because there are a range of different opportunities here uh, for getting involved in STEM subjects. What inspired you to do this job? So my job is a sort of science educator almost. I work with expedition teams, whether that be in the Arctic or the submersible team in the Indian Ocean and on the coral reef. What inspired me to do this is that I think it's very difficult to study science in school without connecting to the work of practicing scientists doing really cool and adventurous science. In the UK, we have a difficulty because I think there are 16 named scientists or science figures in the curriculum. Uh, and most of them are dead. Um, a lot of them have beards. And I think it's really important that we have the likes of Denise, um, Rowana, um, and Paris coming through and talking about the science that they're doing live. So what inspired me to do this job was as an ex-teacher, when I was in the classroom, I didn't have the opportunity to introduce my students to really cool research going around the world. Um, so it's wonderful to have that opportunity now. I think students are awesome. You are all fantastic. Uh, I think you deserve the best education and the most exciting education that we can offer you. Uh, now, <laughs> what was your favorite? Uh, subject at school. That's great from Elston Primary as well. It was really, really, uh, what did I love at school? I loved biology when I was sort of 9, 10 and 11. And then I kind of got switched off it and then my favourite subject was history. Um, and I ended up doing history as a degree. And I think when I look back at my school career, what I realised is that you don't have to worry too much about the choices you make at school sometimes uh, insofar as you can follow your passions and you can end up following a career path um, that is very different to what you studied at school. I think you always have to aim to be excellent in whatever you do. If you wanted to be a research scientist and follow a path in academia like the scientists on board the research vessel that we've been speaking to during the week, then you would have to probably keep on studying the subject that you wanted to end up researching. So in terms of being a marine biologist, you would need to study that at GCSE, A-level, and then at university, also potentially uh, specialising in marine biology um, as well. So the, if you want a sort of a more generalist, route I sort of made up my job, uh, then just follow your passion. If you're looking to become a marine biologist and follow that academic route, uh, then we can sort of see that you need to keep studying those subjects through school. I just got a sort of thumbs up from behind the camera. Are, are we able to raise the ocean's surface? 
fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah. Good morning. Hi, Jamie. It's Robert Carmichael from Global Subdive. How you been? I've been very, very well, Robert. Great, great to hear you. And I think we just put a sub in the water. <laughs> we just put a, a sub in the water. Yes, I, that's fantastic. Um, all, all going well out on the ocean, surface. Indeed, we've had the most remarkable weather for research and uh, capturing a lot of great transect data. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm just seeing if we, we can get you up on, on screen now. Well, you're up on screen. We have a, a good range of schools uh, across the UK and Portugal this morning who've got a lot of fantastic questions. Uh, before we, we dive into to sort of posing some of those to you, could you share with us the, the importance of using submersibles to explore the ocean? Indeed. So one of the most important advantages of using a manned submersible, uh, especially a modern one like the Triton, is you're uh, sitting inside of a totally clear sphere that is optically matched to seawater. So rather than looking at things through a traditional lens of a camera mounted on a remote vehicle, the researcher is actually down inside the ocean and he looks all around and fills all the different environments as they synthesize together in their interactions. So it's a, a really fantastic experience. And you literally don't know where the edge of the sphere is until you reach out and touch it. Yeah. It's optically matched to seawater. That sounds like a, an absolutely amazing experience. And um, your sort of role on, on the expedition is, is chief submersible officer, is, is that right? Right, I, I own Global Subdive and a team of subdive uh, experts are, uh, is what we're made up of. We have two Triton uh, submersibles that operate as a pair. And uh, we're here uh, taking the researchers down into the environment that they're, and collecting transect data and, uh, and also grabbing some uh, samples, both hard coral, soft coral, documenting the marine life that's associated with those. And one of the more interesting things that's been added to the new Necton mission is photogrammetry. So the ability to uh, capture uh, on photographs and video and then build a three-dimensional model of the habitat that the, uh, that the marine life uh, exists in, and bring that back to the world. We, we had Denise yesterday talking a little bit about that work and uh, describing it almost like making a Minecraft model of the deep sea, uh, but using video. Indeed, and very accurate. I mean, dimensionally accurate, color accurate, and uh, you can see all the little details that might really matter to better understanding why uh, certain creatures and, uh, and different marine life uh, uh, thrive in certain areas. And Robert, I mean, forgive me, but being a submersible pilot or being a chief submersible pilot sounds like a pretty awesome job. How, how on earth um, do you get to do your job? Well, you know, I would just advise everyone, if, if you have a goal, you have a dream in life, just stick to it. Um, it took me 35 years to get to where I wanted to be as a submersible pilot and eventually a submersible owner. Uh, I, I did a lot of diving along the way since I was 16, and this is my 40th year at uh, marine diving exploration and now now i get to do it in a submersible so it's uh it's a fantastic goal uh and i never lost sight of that goal so um proud to be here as part of this great mission that's absolutely amazing and you talked about sort of scuba at first what inspired you to to want to sort of follow this goal uh, over the decades so, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the Smoky Mountain uh, Blue Ridge uh, National Park area of North Carolina, up in the mountains. And when I was 16, I took a two week vacation to Florida and my father uh, took me over to the Bahamas and threw me in the water with a scuba tank. And we had a fantastic first dive and I never quit. I, uh, 
just kept diving from that day forward, relocated to Florida and, and have been there ever since so I could have good access to the water environment. Fell in love with it, much like I did the woods when I was hiking and climbing. It sounds absolutely incredible. So, I mean, one of the interesting things is um, that comes from Earlsdon Primary School um, in the UK is, did you, was there anything that you studied or did you have favorite subjects at school that sort of helped you get to where you are now? I uh, always loved math and engineering. Uh, been mostly mechanical by nature and loved mechanical items and just kind of uh, always had a, a, a significant interest in understanding uh, what was out of sight, you know, on the other side of the woods or down deeper in the ocean. I'm just constantly intrigued by seeing something uh, around the next corner. Stay, and, stay uh, curious I, seems to be a message. Stay curious, yeah. Um, and uh, this is from um, um, Heart of Moran at Nishkam School in West London. Have you, during the, the, the Necton mission, have you discovered anything new that you didn't know about before? Uh, we, we believe there are several new species. I'll let the scientists speak to that in detail. Uh, another interesting thing that we believe we're starting to see with the use of CTD, which is an instrument that gets lowered through the water column uh, that measures conductivity, temperature, and depth as a slice of time through the water depth, we're seeing uh, some, some very interesting salinity spikes between 80 and 100 meters uh, here at Aldabra in particular. And the contrast of that means that there's possibly fresh water being forced into the seawater at a specific depth that is relative to the old glacial period 12,000 years ago, which is between 80 and 100 meters deep. That's where sea level was back about 12,000 years ago. And these islands that we see today were probably much greater land masses back then they probably had fresh water like lakes and ponds and that fresh water would have caused vertical conduits through the limestone down to the old sea level and at the old sea level those vertical conduits would have run horizontally out to the old sea level which is somewhere between 80 and 100 meters deep today with these ctd instruments we're seeing the flushing of some what appears to be uh, a different salinity level. And that uh, warrants further investigation and a different uh, set of analysis. So that's, that's a study of hydrogeology. And uh, I think there's some compelling evidence that's being, that's being discovered here at Aldabra that may relate back to the old glacial period of uh, when sea level was 100 meters lower. So I'm just going to break that down for our elementary school audience. Um, so what, what you're saying here is that you've, you've used this instrument to, to, to see what the salinity levels are like at different levels, uh, depths of the water. And in fact, what you're, you're discovering is that there's this underwater river, which would have been on the surface of the sea 10,000 years ago. But because we've had sea level rise since the end of the glaciers, that, that that river is still flowing, um, but it's now 80 to 100 meters underwater. That's incredible. Uh, exactly. So the passageways were probably more like streams back then. Today, they're probably filled with sand and they're very porous. Um, but nonetheless, the initial conduits are, are remain there in some sort of structure. and. Um, we first, it, when we were first subdiving here at Aldabra, we uh, started witnessing a lot of anomalies in the water down at those depths. It looked like oily water. We initially interpreted it as a thermocline or a temperature gradient difference that causes a little blurry effect. But the more we witnessed it, it looked way too thick and oily, as we call it like bubbles of oil and it came in waves 
And uh, turns out it, it looks like what we're seeing is a halocline or a mixture of saltwater and freshwater. And the lagoon here behind me at, at Aldabra, this lagoon is 20 miles long. It's a gigantic inland lagoon and the entrance to it's about 20 meters deep. Uh, and the tidal exchange here is two to three meters. So with that tidal exchange, you get these pressure gradients of surface water pushing down through the old, uh, the old sea level uh, limestone. And that likely is causing some purification of the seawater into something that's more like freshwater. And it might be exiting down at the bottom of the old wall. It sounds incredible. I've, I've got another question. Uh, this is through from Srina Singh. Um, you, sounds, you see amazing things underwater, but what do you like most about your job? Oh, getting, getting to see something new every day that no one's ever experienced. And there's just something magnetic about the, the blue water that uh, attracts me to keep going down there and, and seeing what, what's, uh, what there is new to learn. And every time we get in the water, we find something new to learn. It's, it's a fantastic environment. Inner space has not been explored adequately. There's so much uh, left to learn and, and discover for all of us. And, and I've heard, heard you've been, been nicknamed the fish whisperer on, on this expedition. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? So uh, pretty much on every dive, we've, uh, towards the end of the dive, if not exactly before we ascend, uh, a, a potato grouper, as the locals call them, I think we've got a uh, has, footage of uh, yeah. yeah, they, it's, it's so incredible. They, uh, a, one or two beautiful groupers show up and they, uh, they make friends with us. They've, they come and, uh, they'll put one eye to the sphere and look right in at you very curiously. And then he'll go and sit on top of the sub and just lay there and relax as if it was his sofa. It, it's just the sweetest thing you've ever seen. It, it's like uh, your favorite puppy dog. And what, what kind of size are these um, groupers? So the, the average size would be about half a meter. Uh, two days ago, uh, I saw one that was nearly a meter long. He filled my entire front windshield and he was just so pleasant. He uh, stared in at me very calmly, went around, parked on the side of the sub and uh, just wandered around a little bit very curiously. We got, I think you probably have some video or we've footage been, we've, of we've him or one of his friends. that as, as you've been speaking. It's been yeah. fantastic to see that and, and, and have your description at the same time. Yeah. Um, just on a, on a technical front, um, the students are wondering across, across schools, uh, how do you get a connection in the middle of the ocean? Or, it, it's probably quite far away from a mobile tower. Oh yeah, we, we haven't had a uh, mobile cell tower since the, uh, I believe the 4th of March. It's been quite an interesting uh, period of time quite enjoyable, but uh, we're speaking today through a satellite network and it, uh, uh, it's very, very clear connection as you can see. Um, fantastic. And then from the ship down to the sub, um, Sonderdyne has developed this magnificent uh, technology called Bluecom and it uses optical light waves to uh, wirelessly transmit a uh, fairly significant bandwidth of data between a uh, transceiver mounted on the sub and a transceiver suspended from the, from the ship on a depressor weight hanging um, about 60 meters away from the sub, just kind of tracking and following us. And the light waves just beaming back and forth, communicating uh, like we are through uh, traditional um, radio frequency waves, but using light. Uh, light's uh, got a pretty powerful bandwidth. That sounds incredible, using light to, to 
sort of transmit the underwater world back to us um, here in the UK and, and in fact in many other countries yeah. around the world. It was such an incredible experience to have perfect communication, both audio and, and video while we were down on the sea floor and, and be able to, uh, to transmit what we were seeing in real time uh, back to the rest of the world there on, on uh, international media. That was a, a great experience. I hope we can really learn how to master that and uh, start broadcasting the, uh, the inner space world back to uh, the rest of humanity. It's, it's, well, you're doing a fantastic job. We're, we're loving watching. Um, a question, um, just sort of raising back, back to your sort of uh, potato uh, grouper experiences. And Iman would like to know, has an animal ever tried to communicate with you or attack you while you have been in their habitat? Um, so communicate, uh, yeah, that's, that's a different one, right? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, they, they seem to want to understand what we're doing there. Uh, with respect to attack, we've, uh, each year we, we dive with the great white sharks out in the Pacific ocean as well as part of our global sub dive project. And it's been a fantastic experience and the great whites are curious as well but they've never tried to attack us. They'll come up, they'll look in, you know, these things are five meters long and they're greater in weight than the sub itself. We know they can push us off the cliff if they wanted to, but uh, they've just circled us very politely and they'll stay right with us and they'll come look in the sub and occasionally they'll dart around I have seen slightly aggressive behavior, but never an attacking behavior, just a, an aggressive circling behavior as if they were protecting their territorial uh, domain and just kind of like shoot, get away, move on. But no, they've, I've never been attacked, uh, nor do I think we would ever be attacked down there. Um, it's, it's weird, you're sitting in a bubble and I think uh, when you're outside the sub looking in, uh, we look like tiny people because of the reverse magnification when you're sitting inside the sub. And I, I think they're curious about these people in a bubble. Yeah, it must be a fairly odd experience from, I mean, their point of view to have this very sort of different uh, object com coming through their territory and, and their natural habitat. Indeed, um, a few days ago, we witnessed uh, three sharks that seemed to be just roaming the 120 meter uh, ledge. And we saw them coming from a distance and it's almost as if they went swimming straight by us and did a second take and said, what in the world was that? <laughs> and then they, they kind of came back for a second look, swirled around, circled around us for a couple of times, and then just like, all right, carrying on with our business and they moved on. But uh, it was a fantastic uh, display of uh, predator behavior, uh, and I didn't feel threatened at all. What a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to experience something like that. Um, you seem to be, through all of this, an immense sort of calmness. What skills and attributes, uh, this is a question coming through from Nishkam School, do you think are most important uh, to be successful in, in your profession? So, uh, you know, number one, understand and love the underwater environment. It's a very complex and wonderful world. Uh, getting to know the currents and the marine life, the geology down there, understanding how, how current flows with the geology, the tidal effects, um, becoming a, a, a diver uh, first uh, really helped me in my sub piloting career. Uh, having good communication skills was super important. Uh, understanding electrical and mechanical systems from an engineering standpoint so that you can solve problems while you're in the sub and so that you can understand how to fully take advantage of all the equipment that's, that's in that little um, environment that is your life support system. Okay. We're basically sitting uh, in a, uh, 
a 96 hour uh, capsule. It has enough life support systems, rebreathers and backup uh, water supplies. Uh, you, you can survive there for 96 hours uh, independent of the surface. And so learning all the different disciplines that add up to understanding that piece of technology and understanding the marine environment uh, really uh, are requisites for becoming a great sub pilot. And, and Robert, have you had to use any of your specialist engineering skills during any of the dives um, on this expedition? Um, well, about every dive, you know, you, you use some of those skills. Uh, none of them were life critical. Um, we, uh, you constantly trying to perfect your navigating skills. These transect dives are very tedious. A transect is when we take the sub with uh, six cameras on it and we try to get real one meter away from the reef, hold a steady altitude uh, for 250 meters horizontal, a meter away and a meter off the bottom and run very slowly without uh, losing focus on the cameras. It's a very tedious operation, so you're using four thrusters and a buoyancy control device all at the same time. Uh, so I would tell you that engineering and, and uh, diving skills also pay off uh, during trying to perfect those transect dives, um, for sure. Fantastic. Um Coming from some Earlsdon Primary School, there are, there are a couple of more general sort of questions. Um, first of all, on um, submersible diving and, and then on the expedition in general. Um, Earlsdon Primary would like to know what, what can go wrong on an expedition like this? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, you know, it's it's a challenging environment. Um, parts and pieces wear, uh, they get broken. The ocean is an unforgiving place when it comes to mechanical and electrical appliances. Um, you know, what can go wrong? It's, it's uh, that's a long list. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess our biggest concern on an expedition like this is 48 days long is running out of spare parts, uh, things you didn't anticipate breaking uh, or wearing out. Um, and uh, personal injury, you know, we've, uh, we've managed to stay fairly clear of that, except for a couple of bruises here and there. But uh, yeah, we're, and we've had spectacular weather, uh, which is unusual, usually in a 48 day expedition, you're going to have, you know, 20 or 30 percent uh, strikeouts on weather. Yeah. So far, we've missed no days, zero days for weather. I mean, what you see behind us right now is uh, let me see if I can tilt this camera. Oh, there's the shore. Can you see that? So it's yeah. it's just been uh, nearly that calm every single day we've been here. And the foreseeable three days ahead of us still looks uh, pretty darn good. Uh, we're 1,100 kilometers from the nearest air, international airport right now, so we really don't get uh, the privilege of super computer modeling of our weather data right where we're sitting. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of weather stations and buoys out here, but uh, what we can see so far is we've got great weather ahead of us. That's one of our biggest concerns always so whenever it's like this we try to get in as many dives as we can pull back as much science uh, uh, data as we can put in the can and keep moving on the next morning early fantastic and you i'm just going to take us back you were talking about there being sort of 96 hours worth of life support in the submersibles how where does the oxygen come from because you're you're in this sort of underwater in this closed sort of bubble how do you get oxygen for 96 hours? That was a question from um, Earlsdon Primary. So uh, 
the, the sphere has a, a rebreather system built into it. So there's, there's an electronic fan that blows over uh, a softener lime, a soda sorb type material that removes carbon dioxide from the air. And then there's a oxygen addition system that adds uh, about eight tenths of a liter per minute uh, for two people is what the normal breathing or the normal metabolism, metabolism rate is about eight tenths of a liter per minute. So we carry high pressure oxygen uh, stored on the exterior of the sub in two independent bottles that are isolated as a primary bank and then a reserve bank. They're both equal size and they, they both basically have 48 hours worth of oxygen in, in either bottle. Beyond that primary life support system, there are independent rebreather systems uh, that are canister type that will last six to nine hours. And then there, beyond that, there are uh, lithium hydroxide uh, curtains and blankets that will also purify the carbon dioxide out of the air. We literally hang them on coat hangers if we get deep into that 96 hour period. And um, there's a, a reverse osmosis water pump on board. Uh, so we can plug into a seawater pump and activate this little high pressure hand pump and it forces seawater through a membrane and it, it purifies the seawater into drinkable fresh water. So we can, uh, and we have uh, dry food rations. Um, we have, you know, first aid medical kits, tool kits. Uh, everything stored under the seat, uh, neatly packed away. It's a pretty tight environment in there, but we have everything we need for 96 hours. Absolutely incredible. The amount of uh, different levels of safety um, that you need to have while operating at those depths. Indeed, indeed. Uh, this is a question from um, Marisha. Um, would like to know and you may have touched on this already, is there a part of your job that you do not enjoy? The office. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually we have to head back to the office. And uh, I, I still like uh, getting back there for a day or two at a time. But, uh, you know, being in the field, that's, that's kind of what we're geared for. Um, it is nice to get back land based for, for a little while have the modern conveniences of uh of what uh what a city has to offer but then you start uh yearning to get back out here in the field pretty quickly so a, a couple of couple of days of creature comforts and, and then back out to the joys of of the wide open ocean yeah it, it, unfortunately the ratios don't work out that way it's it's usually about three or four months out in the field each year and the rest of the time, you know, back at the, uh, back at the office in the warehouse, working on new systems, building and repairing the submersibles and our, our ROVs and things. So, uh, but that's all part of the expedition. You have to put a pile of uh, hard labor in and, and uh, office and workshop time in to be prepared for these 48 day missions. I would say the ratio is probably about three to one or four to one. If you're going to spend a month out here, probably need about three or four months back in the uh, back in the workshop and the office, getting everything organized and and ready for these type events. Well, it, it's an am amazing undertaking. Um, it's raised some questions in terms of thinking about uh, working underwater. Uh, is is pressure? Now, how how does pressure um, work underwater and, and how do you deal with that uh, as, as a sort of deep ocean explorer? Well, so in a submersible, the, the, the sphere of the sub takes care of all the pressure for you. You're in a normobaric uh, environment. Um, uh, we uh, have air sorry, conditioning. Uh, something barrack? Uh, uh, a normal barrack? Normo, normo barrack. So we're at, uh, we're effectively at sea level pressure. Okay. When uh, we're sitting at, even at, uh, sitting at 
300 meters. We're still at the same pressure as if you were sitting on the surface. That's, uh, that's why that 80 mils of acrylic uh, protects you from that pressure. Yeah, it's about like that, yeah. And, and uh, how much pressure is that withstanding down at 300 meters? Well, so every, uh, you know, you've, you've got, uh, uh, I, I don't remember the exact PSI at this moment or, or bar, but it's, uh, it's 300 meters. So it's 300 bar, isn't it? So it's, it's, it's 30 about, bar. So is, it, is it one, so at sea level, we have one atmosphere of pressure? And then for every 10 right. meters, every get another atmosphere of pressure. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. So, wow. so, so down at 300 meters, it, it's 30 atmospheres worth of pressure. 30 so atmospheres. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. Yeah. And, and how, how, I mean, does that mean you can't go scuba diving at those depths? It would be very rare to see one scuba dive at that depth. It has been done but not, uh, not regularly. Uh, I think a couple of world record attempts have been made at that depth and most of them unsuccessful. But um, scuba diving in a technical fashion at uh, 100 meters is more frequently done today. But beyond 100 meters, it's very infrequent that uh, even technical divers explore much beyond that. So. Uh, submersibles and ROVs play a big part in the world beyond 100 meters. And for the most part, uh, an active scuba diver would only visit 20 or 30 meters. Okay. And, and, and how, how deep can these submersibles or ROVs, those, these robotic submersibles, go? Our, our submersibles are uh, ABS class rated to uh, 305 meters. And uh, that's, so we work between surface and 300 meters most of the time. And, and are there any submersibles that can go deeper than that? Ah, uh, there are indeed. Yeah, there's, uh, Triton has uh, just uh, delivered and gone on expedition with a uh, full ocean depth uh, submersible. And they're on tour right now uh, on a project called Five Deeps. And they're visiting the five deepest points on Earth uh, this year. And, uh, and they're, they've already accomplished the first two, uh, Puerto Rico Trench. Then they went to the Southern Ocean, dove that uh, deep uh, trench there. And now they're headed into the Indian Ocean to hit the deepest point of Indian Ocean. They'll end up uh, down in uh, the Marianas Trench at uh, 37,000 feet deep uh, later this summer, and uh, they'll they'll do a, a repetitive dive set there as well. So yes, uh, for the first time, man man can visit and repeat a visit to full ocean depth. In incredible. Um, just, just a, a sense coming through. I'm, I'm afraid we've only got sort of a small amount of time left. Um, this is sort of like thinking about how astronauts' um, experience of of seeing our sort of blue marble from space has changed the sense of you know compassion and care for the planet. Has diving deep into the ocean and having these experienced, has that changed your attitude or do you feel differently ab about the ocean and, and what we need to do to sustain it? Well, the, the, yeah, it's, it's an incredible vast body of water, but the top 100 meters are super sensitive and they're super important to the quality of our lives. Um, and that's really the question is, what, uh, what is the quality of life that we all want in the future? Uh, protecting our shallow reefs and the quality of the water is, uh, is all about protecting our own quality of life. The air we breathe, the water we bathe in, the type of beaches we wanna go swim and recreate in. Um, and that top 
hundred meters is what we see under the most, uh, you know, duress right now. It's under a lot of pressure from coastal communities to different uh, pollutions that just weren't obvious to us 50 years ago. We just, 50 years ago, we thought the ocean was so big it could handle everything we threw at it. And now what we've learned over this last five decades is that's not true. It's the, the sustained loading of our ocean environments is causing a negative impact on the quality of human life. And I'm afraid that most people drive down the beach, they go on their vacation, they look out at the water and they only see the surface of it. And because it's still there and it's still beautiful, they believe it's okay. But as a researcher that spends a lot of time in the water, I can tell you in my lifetime, I've seen a gigantic baseline shift from the waters being predominantly clear and blue to be an unhealthy green and brown. And that's a sign of the hard corals becoming um, altered to the point where they're no longer effective habitats. And now it's a soft coral algae type community that won't support the type of marine life that we've all come to know and love that uh, we associate with the beautiful oceans that we like to spend our time in. So. We need to push our heads below the surface of the water. We need to look deeper and look longer and somehow through media, bring this beautiful environment to light and let people understand that it's worth protecting so that our own quality of life can remain uh, beautiful in association with this ocean environment. Robert, thank you so much uh, for joining Submarine Live today. Um, and thank you for that important message at the end about the role we all play in protecting uh, the oceans, wherever we may be. So thank you. We're going to sign off now from you, from the Ocean Surfer and the Necton First Percent mission. But thank you so much and look forward to seeing you soon. Bye bye. Bye, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you so much. And big, big thank you to all those amazing questions you've been sending in. It's been such fun uh, hearing what you want to know, sharing that with Robert on the Ocean Sapphire. Uh, we've got three more sessions today. We've got a submarine shape live investigation coming up in about 10, 15 minutes. We've got submarine Q&As and more investigations uh, in the afternoon and on Thursday and Friday. Uh, if you've enjoyed being part of Submarine Live, Axel XL Oceans Education has Arctic Live. So come and join us in the Arctic too. That is from the 1st to the 8th of May. And you can book online at encounteredu.com forward slash live. But until we have our next session, it's goodbye for now. Bye bye.